I want to thank you for that lovely introduction. It's always so nice to have a friend introduce you. And it's also wonderful to share this award with my colleague from uh, the NIMH days, Dr. Javier Castellanos, as well. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. And um, what an honor it is uh, to be among so many distinguished speakers. Uh, Keith is a hard act to follow. What a courageous and inspirational talk that he gave. But he actually raised some very important points that I want to present today. And that is the importance of development. So very early on, Keith mentioned that there were some issues, and one that he highlighted too is that of anxiety. But I, if I, Mike? <laughs> Great. If you just look at the peak and emergence of all the different mental illnesses that we have, what you'll notice is that each one appears at a different point across development, which gives us some insight into changes that are going on in the brain during those periods of time. So we can begin to get a better understanding of how they're altered or go awry in mental illness so we can try to get them back on track. Now, if you just look across all of these illnesses, what you'll see if you average across all of them is that the peak age when they emerge is right around adolescence. And adolescence is gonna be the focus today of the period in time in which um, I think there are a number of changes that are preparing the individual for probably one of the most stressful periods of their entire life. Trying to find out who they are in the context of having so many social, physical pressures, uh, intellectual pressures and sexual ones too. And so how is the brain changing that allows them to respond to those demands on them, but yet how do they also tend to put you at risk for a disorder during that uh, period? That would help, thank you. Um, my mother taught me I should always know who's behind the curtain. Michael, thank you very much for the AB tip. My father taught me to always turn the on switch on and make sure it was plugged. I guess I wasn't channeling him today. So um, basically, I wanted to um, focus on one of the most common illnesses uh, that occur in our young people today, and that uh, includes the anxiety disorders. They impact as many as one in five of our young people. And the most common treatment, behavioral treatment, that's evidence-based uh, that we use for these individuals is that of cognitive behavioral therapy. This basically involves identifying the triggers of the anxiety and then trying to work with the patient to help desensitize them in a safe environment sort of expose them to those triggers so that they can begin to cope and not be as anxious in those situations or to those events. Now here's the problem. The problem is only about 50% of individuals with these anxiety disorders actually respond to this treatment. So what we have to determine is who's gonna respond and if they're not gonna respond, how can we get better at optimizing our treatments so they are more effective to the others to get a treatment response. So um, one of the issues that we've been trying to understand and that we think is important for us to keep in mind is often the treatments that we use with children and adolescents are ones that were developed originally for adults. And then when we test new treatments, pharmacological or interventional intervention behavioral, um, many times we include children and teenagers in the same trial when they actually have quite significant changes that are occurring in the brain during that time that I'll try to unpack for you. So the questions today and the ones that we've been trying to answer at the Sackler Institute with many of my colleagues, this is not a single person, I'm honored to get an award, but. Um, I know that all the scientists in this room 
will tell you every conversation we have, every talk we go to, and every paper we read influences our thinking and influences our science. So this is a body and program of research that involves a whole community of scientists um, working together with the families um, as well. And so the first question is, how might the brain be changing during this period of adolescence when we see sort of a surge uh, in the mental illnesses? Is there um, peaking and prevalence? How does this development impact how well an individual can respond to a treatment? And then more importantly, we can't just stop there. How can we optimize our treatments perhaps to get that better response? So this is just a, a simplified cartoon where the arcs that you're seeing here are showing connections in the brain. How you see an abundance of those, they increase and then they subsequently decrease. And this is regional in nature. Areas that allow us to see and move tend to develop before those areas that use that information to guide our actions in the future or to guide goal-oriented behaviors. These changes are also occurring during a time when the connections of these regions are getting stronger as white matter or myelin continues to develop. And it's also a time that certain areas of the brain are incredibly sensitive to gonadal hormones, which we know are changing during this uh, period of adolescence. And we have uh, peaks in neurochemicals and neurotrophins that are so important for development and learning that are changing in systems, many times limbic regions that I'm gonna call emotional centers today, before we see some of those same changes in areas in the prefrontal cortex, which is very important for regulating the self and regulating emotions. So while many times when we talk about sensitive periods of development, we focus on those first three years, the first three early development, and that's very important. But I think what's equally important is for us to think about the changes that are occurring during this period and how we can use them as almost an opportunity or window to help change behavior or get the brain trajectories back on track. So because of this regional development, we and others have suggested almost during adolescence that there's something like an imbalance or tension between emotional centers that are reactive, we've all been through adolescence and we know it can be a reactive period, and sort of this later uh, development of projections that can quiet that system, the prefrontal cortex, that helps to regulate that reactivity. And that's shown in this brain. What you'll see is sort of in the glass brain, the red areas are areas associated with that emotional center and they're developing before these green areas in the prefrontal cortex that can actually project to them and quiet them. But here's the deal. This is going to occur in typical development, but there are individual differences that we found in this circuitry that appears to put some people at greater risk for the anxiety disorders than others. And I want to try to illustrate that to you in a movie where I'll be presenting to you cues of potential threat and how an individual who has very low everyday anxiety, how they respond to those cues and how an individual of high anxiety actually responds to those cues. And the cue that I'm going to use today is uh, a fearful face. I'm not suggesting that you're gonna be afraid of a fearful face, but what we've learned over a lifetime is that when we see someone with that expression, there's this uncertainty about what in our environment is, is going wrong, or should we look behind us to make sure nothing's back there? And how quickly can we learn that in this circumstance, that fear, fearful face is not a threat? So it's all about learning that in a certain context it may be safe. Let me see if I can begin this movie. Thank you. Um, so basically what you're seeing is if you've opened up the brain, or cut right at the ears and opened up, and the area in the amygdala is, was bilaterally activated to repeated presentations of this cue, and that was highlighted in orange, but then when it went blue, that was going back to baseline. Now see how that pattern compares to an individual who rates himself as having very high everyday anxiety. And here what you see are the same regions that are activated. It's important to have an initial response 
Is this something I need? What's the emotional significance to this event? But if you're safe, then what should happen is that system should begin to come down. But in individuals who have anxiety, it tends to not only stay up, but many times what you see is it sensitizes. So what we need to, or what we wanted to ask is, since we already know that there are individual differences in the circuitry, and this was based largely on a lot of adult work initially, and we know that there's this imbalance in the circuitry that's occurring during adolescence, how good are we at fear regulation across development? Are there periods in which we're better or not? And the reason we wanted to ask this question is because basically the cognitive behavioral therapy that I described at the beginning where you desensitize an individual to something that makes them anxious, that's basically built on the principles of fear extinction and fear regulation, learning that something is no longer threatening. So the classic way of measuring fear regulation is, um, has been done in rodents. It's called classical conditioning. And all you need to do is pair a tone with just a small foot shock, and you'll see that a mouse over just a few pairings will begin to freeze whenever they hear that tone, even if you're not including the foot shock. So that's the way in which you can condition a neutral stimulus. Uh, to then take on the aversive uh, properties. But what we're most interested in is, once they have acquired that association, at what point do they actually, can they extinguish? And can they equally learn to regulate this across development? Now, this is in mice and we use shocks. When we look at this in humans, we don't use foot shocks, but instead, we use aversive loud sounds, and we pair that with neutral stimuli or pictures that are yellow and blue squares. So in this case, that's illustrated for you, the uh, yellow square is paired with an aversive sound over a few um, consecutive pairings. And then we measure, with these electrodes, you can measure the galvanic skin response. So it's an index of how much they're sweating or arousal. And that's what we're seeing is paralleling that freezing behavior that we see in the mouse. And then when we look at extinction, you just present that by itself and see what the arousal response is and how long does it take for it to actually come down. So first, let's just see if children, adolescents, and adults can learn to acquire these fears in a similar way. And what I'm showing you now are the two paradigms that we used, reminding you of them in the mouse and in the human, and then here's the human data of children, adolescents, and adults, and showing that they equally respond. They're showing um, just as much response to that yellow square that was paired with a aversive sound. So now that we've shown that they can acquire the fear memory, now we wanna know how well can we teach them a new association with that pairing. And first I wanna show you the mouse data. The higher the bar, the better they are at learning that this cue, in the case of the mouse, the tone no longer signals threat. And we see across age that the pre-adolescent mice and the adult mice are better than the adolescent mice. So they're not able to extinguish as well. And so what we then went on to do is to show in humans whether or not this was important. This is parallel work that has been done with Francis Lee's lab and also Rick Richardson's lab in the rat. And we see also in the human the same pattern. So you're seeing this example of preclinical data uh, from the uh, animal work then being demonstrated or illustrated in the human. The question then comes is, how does this in any way associate with how well individuals respond to treatment that includes exposure-based properties. And what I'd like to do is provide, this is preclinical data, so what I'd like to do is provide proof of principle. That is, we've examined existing data to see if there's any hint of a dip during adolescence in their response to CBT, even if it was 12 weeks, if it had four weeks of exposure, to see if we saw um, any clue of a difference. And basically, what we observed, if you look at the preclinical data in the mouse, the human, we see this dip 
that's occurring during the adolescent period. And there was also a meta-analysis where one of the comparisons they looked at across age was to look at children relative to adolescents and older ages, and they too saw this somewhat of a dip during this period of time. So how can we use this information to guide novel treatments then to get a bigger effect? And I want to digress just a second and um, give you a little bit more details about why the prefrontal cortex is so important for fear regulation. When we learn an association or we learn to fear something, when you use extinction procedures, you don't erase that fear. What you do is you create a competing fear memory. So now you have two fear memories. And what the prefrontal cortex is helping us do is sort of um, take care of that competition. Let the safe memory win out over the fear memory. And I've illustrated that here. So this is why we need the prefrontal cortex, is to resolve that competition. But I've also just told you that there's this tension in the slower developing prefrontal cortex during adolescence that can lead to less, perhaps, regulation of the amygdala. And in the rodent studies, we actually showed that adolescents were not activating the prefrontal cortex as much as adults. So how can we bypass this circuitry? And one of the ways that we can bypass this circuitry is to say, hey, we're not going to create a safe memory. We're going to go in, and we're going to change that original fear memory. And the way that we can do this is based on new information that we've had over the past few decades in terms of how memories are formed. We used to think historically that on the top, that memories were static. The minute you encoded something, the next time you recalled it, it was identical. And the next time you recalled it, it was identical. But now what we know is that memories are very dynamic. And so when you recall information, there's a period or sweet spot, roughly 10 minutes after you recall it, that goes on for a few hours, during which that memory is fragile. You can change it, and you can update it. So we can use that to actually go in and change the memory. I actually think this dynamic quality of memory is why um, spousal arguments occur <laughs> very often, <laughs> the way that you remember events that you both attended, I think they get more and more uh, disparate <laughs> as you tell your, um, each of your stories. So, um, so basically, what I'd like to do is show you the same paradigm that we've been using for all the, the studies so far. That's the fear extinction paradigm. They acquire the fear memory, they then extinguish it, and then we bring them back the next day and test to see um, if there's still any response. With extinction, because they're two competing memories, what's going to happen is you're going to get a little bit of a response, and then with the repeated pairings, it's going to go away again. And each time a person comes in for a session, it goes away a little bit more. But again, it is adaptive when you see a cue that could be potentially threatening for you to have a heightened response, but then let it go. But now here's the tweak. It's all about timing. Now, we're going to make this extinction procedure identical, except that we're going to wait before we extinguish. So all we do is they acquire the memory, they come in the next day, we present them a reminder cue, the yellow square. And then we wait 10 minutes. And so that they don't re ruminate since yesterday, the day before, they had heard that loud noise, so they don't ruminate. We let them watch a Tom and Jerry movie or whatever little um, cartoon is in the lab. And then, just after 10 minutes, then we start the extinction. And what do we see? First, I just want to show you, we talked about replication this morning, that we replicated that extinction finding in that adolescents do not extinguish fear memories as well as adults. So this is showing early skin conductance responses. Remember that skin or sweat response? And later, they're not showing that response. That's adults. And see how adolescents are showing less of this over time. But now, let's look at adults and see if we can also replicate the work of Joe Ledoux and Liz Phelps at NYU, where they showed in adults, if you use this paradigm and simply waited 10 minutes before you started the extinction, the next day, you got no recovery of that fear memory. 
and that's what we see in our adults. So basically, these are the individuals who had that update or reminder before the extinction, and these are the ones that had status quo. But we're most interested in the adolescents who are showing diminished extinction. And when we use this paradigm with adolescents, we see something very similar, and that is now we can diminish that fear memory just by manipulating the timing. So let's unpack this in terms of what these results mean in the clinic. It means there are ways in which cognitive behavioral therapy might be tweaked or optimized where we may be able to get a slightly better response for individuals who have fear memory, like phobias or potentially um, certain types of specific anxieties. And so after there is a rapport that's been developed and the, um, the clinician understands some of the triggers for the anxiety, what they do is they come in, uh, the patient comes in, the clinician reminds them of why they're there, bang, that is the key reminder. Then they engage in a rapport that's very comfortable and safe, and they do that for about 10 minutes. They wait until they get into that sweet spot, boom. Then they start the desensitization, and that's when we may be able to get more traction in terms of altering uh, these memories to be a bit more adaptive. This is preclinical data. We're, we're hoping this is giving us traction. We actually have a number of studies at Weill Cornell where we're beginning to look at this timing and see, and I actually think this may explain some of the variability that you saw when we were looking at proof of principle. You saw a little bit of a diminished effect during adolescence, but it was not significant, right? So we need to um, understand that more. But what I hope I've done is try to illustrate um, a way in which understanding the biological state of the developing brain may help inform or help us get better traction in our treatments so that they're more individualized and that we get more precise. We also have work in the laboratory where we've shown that uh, certain genotypes and certain early life experiences can alter this developmental imbalance and exaggerate it. And so um, we're also working to use that information to help uh, make our treatments more precise and target the biological state then when there's that exacerbation. So what I'd like to do is now conclude with the most important slide that you can ever present in a talk, and that is to acknowledge so many people's work who I talked about today, and to thank you very much for uh, attending to this talk. Can we talk questions? A little bit. Questions, yes, yes ma'am. That was so interesting. Um, the question I had first was, it seemed like there's a dip in adolescence, so do children respond to CBT? They do. Okay, so then how do you explain the prefrontal cortex involvement? So that's exactly right, and it's why it's not simply a story of two dual systems, which would be a very simplistic notion of the way the brain works, and it's more in terms of how local connections or circuitry of the brain is talking to one another. So. Um, there's still a lot of maturity that's happening within these local subcortical networks before you can begin to get the distal ones. It's, and um, further, what we're seeing during adolescence is the connections that I talked about that are changing, are, it's more getting rid of or eliminating the excitatory connections, which can also, you can also get this imbalance then too. So um, while I oversimplified these changes, I think it's so important for us to understand that what we are, and I think Javier may talk about this in his talk a bit, it's about how these regions are talking to one another and working together. There's no single bump in the brain that's going to um, be our target, unfortunately, because if it were, I think we would be a lot closer to treatments um, than we are today, and so it's gonna be much more complex. So thank you so much for asking that question. Um, this is, this is, a uh, this is a simple par uh, parenthesis. I was just thinking, I'm, I'm not in the medical field, my field is in law, but I'm just curious because recently they, I think it's uh, um, Sesame Street has included a little autistic child as part of the um, academia for, for children. And I just, it, I was just thinking, while we are great academicians here, 
and we're trying to introduce the sensitivity of uh, mental illness. Perhaps in the future we can also include uh, people from pedagogy, from schools, that we can introduce this as one of the curriculum components in the child's environment so that they become aware that this is part of life. So although it's a small parenthesis in your conversation, it just dawned on me that we gently, in our academic, smaller academic environment, might just introduce it so that it becomes part of the holistic way of living. I think this is a, a very important point um, for this information in terms of education. Um, also, I um, spend a lot of time trying to educate judges um, and the legal system as well in terms of um, you see a peak in criminal criminal behavior during this time, and you can't really predict which one of those children are going to go on. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's very important to keep this in mind, that this is typical development that I was showing you and then how it can be altered to lead to, um, to some of these mental illnesses. Was there, is it okay to take yep. another? Oh, yep, you got several questions, yeah. I just uh, want to thank you for your research and for hope. I was a New York City high school teacher, uh, always in very high poverty communities, and the rate of mental illness, uh, substance abuse, tru you know, truancy, violence is very, very high. How do kids like that who barely have, um, you know, clinical, medical care, access uh, high quality mental health care? They're just, just not enough. So, um, I'm just saying, I, yes, I'm no, advocating <laughs> for social change. Right, so I think while we talk about um, individualized treatments, what we have to realize is that for, uh, to promote mental health, um, we also have to promote um, changes in society and it'll be a, a paradigm shift in terms of the way that we view and, and work with our young people and that's really gonna be the combination um, where we can uh, really get any traction uh, and really a healthier society tomorrow. They're our next generation, so it's very important. Yeah. Um, have you any um, indicators that children who go through this behavioral, uh, this cognitive behavioral therapy who have a high threshold for anxiety or a low threshold, I mean. Right. They get better, they, they respond well to cognitive behavioral therapy. Does that hold for them then when they enter adolescence or is that, do they sort of have to start as babies again with their fears and their anxieties re-emerging so you can get them through childhood and then they hit their late tweens or whatever until their early 20s from, from your scale. Is, it, is there a positive correlation from their childhood experience or are they babies again? Well, um, I think um, what the data suggests is that um, earlier is gonna be better because the pre-adolescence, the preclinical mouse and human data showed that there was a strong response there. Um, we have some longitudinal studies in Nim Tottenham uh, who trained uh, at the Sackler Institute and has a beautiful body of research looking at high-risk populations like early life stress associated with the orphanage, how their circuitry tends to um, almost develop early, as if the sensitive period is, is closing early, and she's finding as children they're doing better. It's as if they're learning very quickly, there are a lot of stressors, and they're trying to adapt to that. We don't know if those children as adolescents are then um, going to have uh, a little less plasticity in the system to handle all the challenges that you have to meet when you're an adolescent. But I think really um, what these data suggest is we, we need to just think carefully in terms of what treatment is gonna get us the biggest impact during that period of time. If we can treat earlier, that's gonna help prevent the chronic uh, symptoms later on, and also if they're not treated before adulthood, 
later physical illness too. I'm not sure if that directly answered your question, but I hope we have some longitudinal data that will come in. Do we still have? Yeah, we got one more. Great. Foster care. R oh, you know, right. Like so, and how we that impact how they transition into the next which is, phase of their right. life, and that's so important given that all the inconsistencies that they get in foster care, in part, like um, it's a different part from the orphanage experience. Uh, are you aware of how um, self-directed neuroplasticity fits in with your research, or how it could fit in in the adult brain? in improving outcomes of therapy? So I do know that there are a number of investigations to see how um, different techniques that help sort of calm the adolescent through exercise and meditation can help them uh, regulate uh, their emotions and behaviors more, but there's a, a lot of ongoing research in that area, and that might not be what you're referring to. But I'm happy to discuss this later. I'll be around if that's okay. Uh, uh, Excuse last me. One, last one would be good. Can I Here? ask this? Hi, sorry. Okay, given what you presented, um, and maybe I'm going to ask you to do a projection, but children with ADDH um, have tremendous anxiety, and what is the success, or have you used this therapy with those children, and do you have data to show the improvement or the lack of improvement? So we don't have this data specifically for children with ADHD, but I actually think that's a beautiful segue into the next talk by Dr. Javier Castellanos, who is going to be talking about ADHD. How's that Thank for you. a pass off? Perfect. <laughs> Perfect.